A Gathering of Days, A New England Girl's Journal, 1830 to 1832, a novel by Joan W. Bloss. Chapter 18. Wednesday, October 26th, 1831. With what amazement did Daniel and I hear our father describe as a prank Monday's happening? Meanwhile, Lamon has firmly decided that neither Maddie nor I, her daughters, shall continue to be exposed to such common cruelty on a teacher's part. Consequent to all of which, Maddie and I are withdrawn from school starting this very day. So we were told on arriving home, Maman and father awaiting our return with news of their decision. Maman says she will continue our instruction. Tis not, f is, tis not for naught I'm a teacher, she says, and has already written to Boston for the needed books. Dear Maman, with her faith in books and ever ready pen, Daniel was to have studied with us. However, pleading his loyalty to Asa, David, and the other boys, he has regained reluctant consent to continue at school. Maddie thinks it is a holiday, for all I heard her explain to Asa about our maman, who was once a real teacher and not just for summer term. Thursday. What would think it a school house full instead of just two girls? My mom announced when breakfast was cleared that she will set the lessons for us every morning early. Then we are to have two hours to study. After that, she will hear us and provide correction. Today's attempt, perhaps being the first, was surely comical. At what age, Catherine, my scissors, please, was Pocahontas when Captain John Smith fell into the Indian's hands? And scarcely had I answered twelve but that she turned to Maddie with a moral catechism. What is justice? It is giving every man his due. What is generosity? It is some act of kindness performed for another which strict justice does not demand. What is gratitude? Gratitude is a thankfulness of heart for favors received. Today, however, the familiar words were mixed with exclamations. Dear child, do raise up the pot. Maddie, that sauce is going to scorch. Catherine, watch your stitches. Friday, October 28th, 1831. Aunt Lucy Holt is going to have a baby in early spring. Mrs. Shipman told my mom this very afternoon. Saturday, October 29th, 1831. Nearly the whole of my quilt is pieced. Maman says we must hold a quilting and that she will speak to father soon whether the quilting frame will serve, or does it need repair? Sunday, October 30th, 1831. Father sat down near me today, just as the Sabbath ended. I had spread my quilt blocks out, assessing them for joining. After a bit, he looked at me, clear. Your mother would be glad of this. I knew not how to answer. Presently, thoughtful, he commenced again. This time he had more to say, and which I must try to record exact for what came afterwards. It was an apt choice, he began, for are we not, all of us, wanderers and strangers, and do we not, all of us, travel in danger or voyage uncharted seas? At once I saw he meant my stranger, who was safe, all hazards survived, and Cassie, too, who had been called on a greater journey to rest on the opposite shore. Do I blaspheme to join them thus? The one so fair, the other so dark? One dear and one a stranger? I do now believe we all are joined, wherever we are, whatever we do, and be we quick or be we dead, fair, dark, dear, or stranger. Monday, October 31st, 1831. Today, at last, was I prepared to attend to the free man's lace. At once a sad remembrance and happy messenger. While my tears ran freely down, I laid his gift beside her grave, wrapping with it scented flowers, which we dried at summer's close, lavender and petals of rose and spiced geranium. 
I have told no one what I have done, nor need to, knowing it right. Tuesday, November 8th, 1831. Sophie, once so flibberty gibbet, sends good earnings home. All of the mill girls protested their pay, and as tis known, no girl in New England would take a place till the issues resolved. The owners knuckled under rather than stop the mill. Perhaps when I attain fifteen, younger than that, I may not go. I shall join Sophie in Lowell. Unless by then she is in Ohio, which may be the case. Thursday, November 10th. She is helping me to knit a cat for Aunt Lucy's baby. All the stitches must be just so, and as we are using the finest of threads, this is woeful hard. I wonder when the baby is born if they'll name her for Cassie if it is a girl. Wednesday, November 23rd, 1831. Because they are so lately bereaved, we did not engage the shipments in Thanksgiving Day. Neither, therefore, did we feast. But going to church, I wore my blue bonnet, its color a compliment to my blue collar, and as was intended to the blue of my eyes. Monday, December 12, 1831. Father says he must be certain to purchase our Leave Its Almanac for 1832. Others have spoken with favor of others. But we buy Mr. Leavitt's, he being of this county, and a sometime acquaintance besides. Monday, December 19th, 1831. Portion of a letter received by Mrs. Shipman. It is from Aunt Lucy Holt, and, because it concerns me so greatly, Mrs. Shipman has given it to me, and I, for safekeeping, thought to attach it here. And would you please inquire of her parents whether Catherine might come to us after the baby is born? I believe her help will be very much needed. I am greatly alone, no friends, and we think her qualified. The academy admits no females, as you know. The district school is poor. But Edward remembers that C is quite clever and would give her private instruction in the usual courses of study. This we propose to regard as exchange for the services she provides. We would assure her attendance to church and good attention to health. She will find this a studious house. Edward reads so beautifully. Every evening from eight o'clock till 10. He engages us in study. I know I cannot begin to tell you the bliss of these short hours. We have already read much in French and some philosophy. We beg the favor of an early reply concerning Catherine's coming. You can provide our address to her parents and do encourage them. At the start of this journal, I wrote of my wish to stay here forever and ever. Also that I wish to become better and more gladly able to do what I am asked. Today, reflecting on Aunt Lucy's letter, I know I shall find good consequence in whatever is decided by father and maman. Thus it now appears to me that trust and not submission defines obedience. Tuesday, December 20th, 1831. I, who've not traveled past Concord and Keene, and to take up residence hours and hours away. It is the wish of father and maman that I accept Aunt Lucy's post, and they will inform her by letter. I will have ample time to prepare. The baby's not due to be born until spring. Father says I am fortunate. I need not travel till snow and ice and mud will have left the road. Friday, December 23rd, 1831. Mrs. Shipman confided to us she's put away forever the clothes that Cassie wore. She worries that some might consider this wasteful, there being good wear in them yet. But Maman spoke right out and said that what she done was right. New Year's Day, 1832. How swiftly the year has turned. Winter found spring, and spring became summer. And, as Priest Fowl reminded us, to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. 
This year, more than others, has been a lengthy gathering of days wherein we lived, we loved, were moved, learned how to accept. Saturday, January 14th, 1832. Today I stood in the shipman's house, my eye admiring the painted scene which Cassie herself had shown me not many months ago. There were the elms in tiny leaf, making it spring forever, she'd said. And so it was, and so it is. For though the wind is bitter outside, for Cassie it is spring forever, nor shall she leave that season. Later some words, neither sought nor remembered, presented themselves to mind. Now let every occasion fill, command thy heart to joy. Can it be some hymn once sung, imprinted on my infant sense, although not comprehended? Where come such words? For my own self, glad, although not unafraid, I am determined to obey, believing that only the form of instruction is mysterious. Friday, February 3rd, 1832, heavy snow, knitted all afternoon. Sabbath, snow again, could not go out. Tuesday, February 7th, 1832. We expected the breaking out. It will be the first for Daniel, the second time for me. Tis hard to think he was not here, no, nor even known to us, to share the last occasion. Thursday, March 8th, 1832. I am to leave at daybreak and cannot sleep tonight. Thus I have stolen down the stairs there every rough edge known to me, to sit by a single candle's light with this, my companion, my journal. I wonder if it is common to feel that never is a place so loved as when one has to leave it. There, near the door, my two trunks wait, and folded atop them is my traveling cloak, also the novel Northwood by Mrs. Sarah Josepha Hale. This is a gift to me from Maman. She ordered it from Boston. Father made much of the weight of my luggage and said that anyway, he believed I would be home by summer. Yet now is the night still, dark and cold. The fire has long since turned to ash with only the, the back log glowing. In the next room lie Father and Maman, while in the loft above me, Daniel dreams, his farm boy dreams, and Maddie, I have no doubt of it, allows herself excursion in to my half, to my half of the bed. The very thought recalls me. Good night, dear place. Dear house. Dear all. Good night. And now, goodbye. Providence, Rhode Island, December 9th, 1899. My very dear Catherine, I am so grateful for your letter and glad to know you enjoyed the journal I kept when a girl. You asked about the runaway slave. He was he who was certainly not a phantom, but a real though tiny part of what was happening everywhere then and what was going to come. I never heard from him again, though sometimes, indeed for years and years, I used to imagine what I would do were there a knock upon the door and there he was, Curtis. He never came, of course. Joshua Nelson stayed on as a farmer. Two of his boys went off to fight in the war between the states. One, the younger boy, I think, got killed at Gettysburg. Then Josh signed up to take his place and got wounded pretty bad. It never healed the way it should, him not being young at the time. He died a couple of years ago. We exchanged Christmas cards right up to the end. All of the others are gone now too, except for me and little Willie Shipman. I still think of him that way, although the last I heard of him, someone was making a party, him turning 75. No, I didn't forget to tell. We had no presents at Christmas, then, nor at birthdays either. The first I saw a Christmas tree must have been in Boston, 
and I was about 23. Well, I'm going on 83 now, but not about to quit. There are too many things I know about where I want to see what happens. You, my dear, being one of them, and this new century starting. Do what you can to make it good, and remember, as we used to say, that life is like a pudding. It takes both the salt and the sugar to make a really good one. Lovingly, your great-grandmother, Catherine Onesti. P.S. Thank you for telling me about the chair, that it is not worn too badly. After Maman and Father died, it went to my sister Maddie. Maddie never had children, though, and her husband died before her. So when she passed on, it came back to me, and I, having no use for it, then gave it to your mother. You are very clever to have figured that out. C-H-O